fine. You always say that, but I won't. Okay, okay. Namaste, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you're tuning into this live stream broadcast from. Welcome to a very special broadcast. My name is Nishit Kotak. I'm here with the team from Hindu Academy. So today we are celebrating the occasion of Mahashivratri. And that is basically a, 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 a Mahashivratri means a great night of Shiva. And it's a Hindu festival that's observed uh, annually. Uh, in early spring, typically. It's around between February and March in the Gregorian calendar. Uh, on Mahashivratri, uh, we, uh, the devotees of Lord Shiva will observe a day-long fast. They will stay awake throughout the night in vigil and worship of the deity. And they offer special prayers, perform Abhishek, which means a ritual bath of the lingam, a symbol of Lord Shiva and chant mantras and hymns in his praise. The festival is also marked by processions, special decorations, lighting of lamps and bonfires, etc. Mahashivratri is considered one of the most auspicious days in the Hindu calendar, and it is believed to have many spiritual and mythological significances. According to legend, it is the night when Lord Shiva performed the cosmic dance of creation, preservation, and destruction. It's also believed to be the night where Lord Shiva married Parvati, his consort. Now, this festival is celebrated across India and many parts of the world by millions of Hindus. It is particularly significant for the uh, Shivite sect, uh, who, which reveres Lord Shiva as the supreme deity. The Mahashivratri is an occasion for spiritual renewal and the blessings of Lord Shiva for prosperity, health, and well being. So welcome everybody to today's very special session. Um, how can you get involved? Very simple. Please do make sure you like, follow, subscribe, etc. Share this broadcast with your friends and family. The more people that jump onto the call with us, the better the conversation we're going to have online because we will be taking your comments, your thoughts, your questions live on air. You can just post your questions onto our social media channels where we are streaming live on Facebook and YouTube at Hindu Academy. We will pick up your questions and answer them live after this focus topic video, uh, which I'm going to play for you next. And after this video is finished, we will enter into a Q&A around the focus topic of today, which is discovering Shiva, a spiritual journey on Shivratri. So enjoy this little video and I will be back shortly. We come to the third personality that is thrilled again and excited the Hindu psyche. And this personality, whether he has come down to earth, avatar, we are not so sure. When you look at some of the personalities in the Hindu tradition, they reflect this personality. For example, the one that I find very much reflecting this third personality, the third personality is Shiva. And say, has Shiva ever taken birth on earth? When you do the story of Rama and you say, Hanuman was actually, if you like, an incarnation of Shiva. Helping out Ram. You know, Ram gets into difficulties, so of course Shiva has to come and sort him out. And then, you see, when I look at Swami Vivekananda, I look at this personality sitting in meditation, I say, ah, that is a piece of Shiva that fell down to earth. You see? So you can say Shiva Palace did not take birth, but when I look at some of these personalities, everything that can be attributed to Shiva can be attributed, attributed to such personalities. So what are the key features of Shiva? First of all, the name Shiva itself signifies something unique that is necessary. You see, when you want to build relationship with this super personality, say Vishnu, uh, you know, coming down to earth as Ram or Krishna, you need to build up a relationship. And of course, the only way the relationship comes to fruition is if they give their grace to you. They say, okay, I like you, so you can see me now, and I'll pull you towards me. You need grace of God. There's God, and there's God's grace. With Shiva, you get two for the price of one. So you get God and God's grace combined. Shiva means grace. So it is not God, but it's a God and God's grace rolled together. That's the meaning of the word Shiva. And what are the unique features of the Shiva? Makes him very endearing. And a lot of people are attracted to Shiva because 
The reason is this, Shiva is called Ashutosh, it means easy to please. You see, the, this Vishnu is a tricky chap, he takes a lot of hard work. You know, like poor Dhru had to spend so many days and months and years meditating and Vishnu was a tricky chap. With Shiva, things are easy peasy. Little bit of Bilva leaves, he says, yeah, what do you want now? <laughs> no, he pops up straight away. He's a kind of easy chap, because I told you his name is Grace. So when you say, Shiva, you won't invoke this grace straight away. He says, yeah, yes, what can I do for you? Straight away. Mm -hmm. Ashutosh. Well, when I say easy to please, what does it mean? The ritualistic aspect that is visible, say in the Vaishnavite tradition, they are elaborate. the worship is very elaborate. You must do this, 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 this. You must follow through, otherwise Vishnu will get mad at you. Instead of being happy with you, be really annoyed with you. But Shiva makes him make a mess. He says, ah, oh, my sweet boy, he's making a mess, but he loves me. Off he comes, straight away. He says, come, go away, Shiva, I didn't ask for you. But, no, but you were praying, you know. Easy to please. In the ritualistic aspects, cut to the minimum. Minimum. This is why it's called Ashutosh. Easy to please. Special feature. Another feature about Shiva that you like is this, that I like is this. You see, with the Vaishnavite tradition, you can never really bridge the gap between the idea of God as some super personality you're building links with and God as your essential nature. That remains distant. You are not even allowed to think like that. You are nobody. God is everything and you are nobody. You are made to think like that. In fact, the way you can distinguish between the Shiva and the, and the Vaishnava tradition, tradition is very nice. It's Hari Hara. You heard the word Hari Hara. Hari means one who attracts. So Vishnu looks very grand, well dressed, you know, and it's always so attractive. And Shiva is on the other extreme. Hara, Harati from Harati. He's going to demolish all this grandier business. Raw, he's raw. So you, when you see Shiva, any ground, do you see golden thrones or anything like that? No, just ash, poor chap, ash, and little animal skin around his waist, and that's Shiva. See, he's broken through all this nonsense. He said, no, there are two ways of making spiritual progress. First, you get attracted to these marvelous godly qualities of Vishnu and Ram and Krishna. The second way to make spiritual progress is to recognize that all this is external, superficial. I want the heart of the matter. I want spirit. So I'm going to do Harati. Remove this distraction of external showmanship and go to the heart of the matter. This is the feature of Shiva. That's why it's Hari, Harati. There's a difference between Hari and Hara. You see, with Shiva, this unique feature is visible. Not only can you relate to God as some super being that you say, Oh God, I love you. Please show your grace on me. He says, Don't you see? I am your essential nature. I am very much part of you. Where else will you search for me? I am your innermost self. So with the Shiva tradition, you have this unique feature. You can say, you can equate yourself with Shiva. In the Vaishnava tradition, if you went to any Vishnu temple and started saying you are equal to Vishnu, four people will come and do tingatori and <laughs> throw you out. You know, how dare you, is an arrogant chap. In the Shiva tradition, if you don't do it, they say, he has not understood the whole idea of Shiva. And this is the lovely stuff from Adi Shankara. One of the, it's, it's quoted in, your, in the notes. It says, you can say, Shivo hum, Shivo hum. And this is not an arrogant comment. It is it's a very humbling comment saying, my essential nature, despite external appearance of being a real idiot and real nuisance, my essential nature, oh Lord, is you, Shiva, Shivo hum, Shivo hum. I am thee, my Lord. Now you see, have you noticed in the Vaishnava tradition you have different ways of relating to God? You say, okay, um, Dasya Bhav, Vatsalya Bhav, Sakya Bhav, uh, Madhur Bhav, lovely, lovely ways of relating to God. In the Shiva tradition, what, what power do you have? What is the closest relationship you can have with anybody? Tell me. With yourself. See the power of Shiva tradition. He's saying, don't you see? The, the, the closest relationship you have with anything, forget about God, is an external thought. It's just a thought process. It's your true self, with your true being. So the idea of the Shiva tradition is build relation with your true self. So begin to ignore your, your false or this external self, which is quite a nuisance anyway, and recognize your true, true, true being as one with God, as Shiva. It's not an arrogant comment. It is saying, don't you see? 
the closest you can get to anybody is to yourself. And your real self is Shiva. Shivoham, Shivoham, very visible in the Shiva tradition. There's another lovely feature to the Shiva tradition that you must immediately recognize and give full marks. In the Vaishnava tradition, the idea of female is still secondary, even though they say, no, 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 that's the power of God and all that. It's still secondary, because when you see Vishnu, you know, lying you know, on the bed of serpent, and who is massaging his feet day and night, day and night? Poor Lakshmi ji. You can give her grandia, say, oh, Lakshmi ji means, you know, but why is she massaging all the time? It's not fair. With the Shiva tradition, equal emphasis paid to both the genders. And you see this marvelous idea of Earth Narishwar. First time, the idea that God and God's power are strongly linked, you cannot separate them. Given dignity, equally, you know, making, bringing the idea of equality, very, making it very visible. Earth Narishwar, the idea that God can be thought of as female too. So this idea, again, not in the Vaishnava tradition, in the Shiva tradition. So I'm just you know, scoring points for the Shiva tradition now, of course. But then when I talk of Vishnu, oh, I love them as well. So you get caught up. When you look at them, they go there. So why am I saying this? Because it's, you should be able to recognize that the reason why Hindus don't feel, you know, they don't feel that something has gone wrong, they're not scoring points. They're saying that the way your mental makeup is will decide which particular aspect of Godhead you are attracted to. So your own mental makeup, in a way, will dictate whether you're attracted to Ram, goody goody straightforward chap, Krishna, this naughty chap with pluralism, or Shiva, who gives you the highest dignity, you decide. So in a way it allows us this opening of thinking about spirituality in a variety of different ways. It is open to that. So these are the unique features of the Shiva tradition. I just touched on some of them. Fabulous. So we had a really wonderful video there talking about Shiva. Uh, and so welcome once again, all our Hindu Academy community members. We are thrilled to have you here on this special day of Mahashivratri, where we come together to celebrate the glory and power of Lord Shiva. And we want you to be part of it. So we want you to feel the energy, excitement, and the devotion that this day brings. We want you to engage with us, share with us your thoughts, your comments, your questions. We want you to join us in creating a state of love, unity, and transformation. So here's what we want you to do. Get ready to participate in the comments area on the live stream channels on Facebook and YouTube and share with us where you are watching this live stream from, how you're celebrating Shivratri in your local area, what Lord Shiva means to you. Ask us your questions and your thoughts and let us know how we can help you deepen your spiritual practice. So <clears throat> before we get started, I'm just going to quickly introduce the team here. We've got not only full house, but we have also got a special guest today with us. Welcome, uh, Vijay Pai, Manish Pai, Sita Ben, and Uma. Hello, Uma. Joining us for the very first time on the live stream broadcast. So this is going to be a very special broadcast. Let's get started with uh, the Q&A section. So folks, if you've got any questions about this uh, um, Shivratri, what it means, Lord Shiva, put them in the comments area. I'll pick them up. So let's get started. I'm going to do a rapid fire style because there's so many questions around this. So, uh, Sita Ben, who is Lord Shiva in Hinduism? Uh, so in Hinduism, as you know, there are so many different deities. We've got 330 million different kinds of deities. But Shiva is considered to be one of the most popular deities. Um, the thing is, when he is considered as part of the, the trinity, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, um, people often say, oh, you know, Brahma is the creator, Vishnu is uh, the preserver and Shiva is the destroyer. But if you are a Shiva devotee, they say, hey, hang on, why should we be the ones who are given the destruction role? <laughs> so actually, if you're a Shiva devotee, you say that Shiva is actually the one who encapsulates creation, preserve, pre preservation and destruction. And and you really clearly see that with the image of Nataraj, uh, which is Lord of the Dance. So in the symbolic um, significance of it, uh, Shiva is dancing in a circle of fire. Um, he is holding a drum, which represents creation. He's 
holding out his hand in blessing, which means preservation. I'm here to protect you. And it also means destruction because uh, he's holding a flame of fire. So you can see creation, preservation and destruction in the image of Nataraj, uh, which is really, really beautiful. And um, as, as Dad said so clearly in the video, this idea of thinking of yourself as divine is so prominent in the Shiva tradition it gives so much dignity to all of humanity really uh, dignity to you know whatever sort of gender you are what group you're from what what kind of preferences and what kind of beliefs you have it gives you tremendous dignity to practice spirituality in the way that suits you so it's real democracy and it shows tremendous uh, dignity for the whole of the living kingdom because animals and you know plants and everyone is given tremendous dignity in the Shiva tradition which is a slightly different angle to the Vishnu tradition because Vishnu the idea of Vishnu is I pay reverence to Vishnu and I have to sit at his feet and admire his lotus eyes and it's all that kind of of a way of thinking, whereas the idea, as, as Dad said so beautifully in the video, Shiva, hum, Shiva hum. I am Shiva, I am that divinity myself. I don't have to just sit outside and admire it. I am that divinity, I am that beauty myself. So it gives tremendous dignity to, to yourself. Um, would you mind? Yeah, uh, no, I think that uh, you pretty much got it, Sita. I think that when you say Shiva, there's just quite a big history, rich history around Shiva. And there's multiple, as Sita mentioned, there's multiple ways you can see, uh, see the idea of Shiva. The Shiva can come in many facets, as, as you can see. So it depends. There have been very, very many Shiva, Shiva traditions in India, and they all have different ways of worshipping Shiva. Shiva is very broad, but I think Shiva is, in a way, one of the oldest deities in Hinduism. In the earliest uh, evidence we have from uh, the Indus Valley, you see uh, Shiva in the form of Pashupati Nath meditating. We're talking about 600, you know, 2600 BC. But I think Shaivism, Shaivism as a kind of a organized uh, movement, I guess, maybe just 200 BC, perhaps. We're not really sure. But Shiva is, is very popular and is worshipped all over India in many different ways. Amazing. So, um, Vijay, my next question for you um, What are some of Lord Shiva's key attributes and symbols? <clears throat> oh, amazing. Because <laughs> Shiva is, in a way, as Sita mentioned, Shiva is seen as different. He's seen as Hara. Hara means the one who renounces. So the key attribute of Shiva is renounce, to give up. Why? To give up things so you focus inwards. So if you look at, compare the two, like as, if you come with the idea of Vishnu, which Hari means to attract. And Hara means renounce. So in a way, it's Harati, to so renounce. So if you look, even if you look at the image of Shiva, it's very simply dressed. He doesn't have gold ornaments. He has, you know, ash on his body. So it's quite the, uh, different from the idea of Vishnu. So in many ways, the idea to give up. And in many ways, Shiva can be seen as a um, kind of uh, introspection, self-reflection. That's the kind of idea on uh, Shiva. Uh, Sita? Uh, yes. I mean, I think it's incredibly sort of humbling and very self-effacing. I think you know, the personality of Shiva is so tremendously self-effacing. It's not like, oh, look at me and look at how beautiful I look and my lovely jewels and ornaments. There's nothing like that. He's dressed in the simplest of the simplest ways, um, which is, is beautiful in itself because it's saying that spirituality doesn't depend on appearances. It doesn't depend on how you look. It depends on who you actually are. Um, and that's why Shiva is shown, you know, he's like covered in ash. He's wearing animal skin. He's, you know, got very, very little in the in way of embellishment, basically. Um, so I think that simplicity shows the real sort of beauty. And that's also reflected in the practices around the Shiva tradition, because as Dad said in, in the video, um, the idea of Vishnu, if you're a Vishnu devotee, you have very sort of elaborate rituals. Um, you know, you have to follow this and this and this. It's quite rigorous if you're a Vishnu devotee. Whereas if you are a Shiva devotee, it's much simpler, much more straightforward. All the rituals are sort of cut down to the minimum because it's saying rather than focusing on the externals, the rituals, let's focus on finding out who we truly are. That's the ultimate sort of conclusion of the spiritual journey. Um, so if you are a, a Vishnu devotee, you know, you kind of see yourself as building a relationship of love with Vishnu, whereas with the Shiva tradition, yes, I mean, it is it is about developing that love, but also seeing that same thing inside you, which is actually the conclusion of the journey of love anyway. Um, so it's a very beautiful thing. Fabulous. So, uh, Little Loma, you've got a lot of greetings from around the world. Everyone's <laughs> to you. And uh, 
So we move on to the next question, uh, Manish Pai. So we've looked at who is Lord Shiva. We've looked at what are some of the key attributes and symbols. We've looked at the significance of Lord Shiva in, as being part of the Trinity in Hindu mythology. So uh, here with us, how is Lord Shiva worshipped in Hinduism? Uh, Lord Shiva is uh, very popular in Hinduism and people worship the image of Shiva. They would have image of him uh, in their altar and they would, uh, you know, uh, chant Om Namah Shivai. Uh, there is uh, also many temples we have sibling and uh, people pour milk and uh, water on the sibling. And uh, it's, these are the two forms uh, Shiva is worshipped in. And his image of meditation is a very popular image and that represents he is a master of yoga and meditation. And uh, you could uh, use the Om Namah Sivai Mantra for the meditation as well. <clears throat> so Sita Ben, back to you. What's the story behind Lord Shiva's third eye? Oh, yes. Uh, so it's really beautiful, actually, because um, when we sit down to meditate, because the specialism of Shiva is meditation, as Manish Bhai just said. Um, so you have Nataraj, which is Lord of the Dance, but you also see Shiva as Yogi Raj, which means the master of meditation. And the whole point is when you sit down to meditate, you focus on the point in between your eyebrows. Um, that's considered to be a very special point because when you are successful in meditation, um, that point sort of gets charged up. Um, and that's actually why we put bindis and we mark this point between the eyebrows just to remind ourselves of how important the point between the eyebrows is. And uh, Shiva has got his third eye and in a lot of sort of Hindu mythology, um, you see... Um, is it the eye thing? Yes, um, it's the eye. <laughs> um, so sometimes in a lot of Hindu mythology, uh, you see stories of Shiva where, you know, he's sometimes he's got a bit of a temper yes, and he yes. opens his... Your eye here is full like this. Um, yeah, he opens his third eye and, you know, it kind of like magical powers come out of it, basically. Um, so it's got a lot of significance. It's sort of represented through the colourful mythology. And it's also represented culturally as well, because we love to mark the spot between the eyebrows. Um, it's it's a, sort of, in a way, become a bit of a fashion statement, but it's um, originally a very spiritual idea that that point is is very significant. Um, would you like? Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, yes, sir, yeah. <laughs> so, because I've got a number of questions, I'm going to whip past and go to Vijay Bhai for the next one. So we see Lord Shiva with the trident. So what's the significance of uh, the trident? Well, there are many different views on that as well. <clears throat> some say the trident is the uh, uh, three gunas. Some say just his weapon for defense. Uh, some say it's to control uh, different uh, facets of our body. You know, for... <clears throat> so there's many different ways. There's not just one uh, single uh, meaning on that here. Yeah. Fabulous. Manish Pai, the next question for you is, how does Lord Shiva relate to the concept of creation and destruction in Hinduism? Uh, Sita Ben already covered the idea of uh, Nataraj Seva. Uh, uh, when uh, dancing Seva, playing the drum uh, is the uh, idea of creation uh, around uh, fire, which represents uh, creation, I think. And... Uh, or fire represents this destruction and uh, playing of drum, uh, creating the vibration that creates the universe. So the whole idea of an atraj is uh, the creation and destruction in one. So in the Siva tradition, they would say Siva represents both uh, creator, preserver, and destroyer. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Sita Ben, the next question. So Hindu religion is filled with colorful stories, myths, and legends. So what are some of the important myths and legends associated with Lord Shiva that stand out for you? Uh, yes, actually, there's, there's so many beautiful stories um, from the Shiva tradition, which talk about this um, Advaita philosophy, basically. And one of the stories which I say to Umar sometimes for bed, Time stories is the story of um, Shiva and Parvati and being you made. Say, and you say, you also say the one where where Gopal Mama 
sees Krishna That's right. in real life. That's right. Sorry. Um, yes. Uh, so the story of Shiva and Parvati and um, where Ganesh, his two children, Ganesh and Karthike, they have a little competition and as to who Krishna can go around wins, the world fast. He just goes around to mum and daddy. Yes, he goes around. And daddy, who are the universe, um, because it shows this idea that every, the God is in the universe, God is percolating through the universe. Um, so it's incredibly important to see this idea of Advaita shown in such a simple way that children are able to understand it. So I think it's a very elegant way of presenting a very subtle idea. Wonderful. We're having a very interesting conversation so far, folks. Remember to put your questions, thoughts and comments in the live stream channel where you're watching us today. Uh, let us know how you celebrate Shivratri in your area as well. If you have any questions about Shiva, please do put them in. Um, Vijayabai, the next question I have for you is, what's the symbolism behind Lord Shiva's dance known as the Tandav? <coughs> I think that's the same question. The Tandav, Tandav dance is actually the dance of Krishna destruction, which is done by uh, Nataraj. And okay. interestingly, there's a, there's a very big image in Sun as well of Nataraj. If you go to Sun Labs, where the, where the experiment with, you know, the some atomic, atomic particles, you see that. But something else to where the, the dance is actually also very popular in India and in Mahashivratri because today night, basically, in some of the great temples of India, I think in Gujarat is Modera Temple, the Sun Temple, in Konark, and some other temples in India, the, uh, even Chidambaram, they, will do a, they do a dance festival to kind of mimic the idea of the Tandav dance. So Tandav dance is very famous in that sense, his dance. Even if you look at the... There's a movie, was it called uh, Bahubali, I think, yes? There's a song on that, the idea of Tandav dance. And it's another strange thing about Tandav dance is the lyrics are said to be written by Ravan, the king of Lanka, you know? So there's a very big story behind the idea of dance. But you just think the dance of creation and destruction. And that's one of, the, one of the reasons we've seen as the day, the day he danced is seen as Shivratri as well by a lot of uh, Shaivite followers. Yeah. Amazing. I'm just reading about it. It says the Tandav dance is said to be a vigorous and powerful dance. I, I know the dance form itself is very vigorous yes. and powerful. And it does symbolize, like you said, the, the creation, preservation, and destruction. Yeah. And uh, so overall, it's a powerful and vibrant symbol of power and energy of Lord Shiva. Amazing. Uh, Manish Bhai, next question for you, uh, which is, uh, what is the significance of the snake around Lord Shiva's neck? Uh, I'm not too sure, but it may represent Kundalini energy, which is related to the Tantra and uh, yogic power that uh, rises up and one is enlightened. Um, probably Vijay Bhai can back me up on that. Vijay Bhai? Hi. Yeah, that's, that's the best idea, I think, on that one, yeah? There's not much to add, yeah? Superb. So, what's the story, uh, Vijay Bhai, what's the story behind Lord Shiva's marriage to Parvati? Oh, there's, <clears throat> that will take a long time to say the whole story. But a, there's a big story about, you know, initially he said to me, somebody called Sati, then because she was, um, uh, what do you call her, uh, humiliated by her father, she actually uh, took a life and he reborn again as Parvati. But Parvati and Shiva is, in a way, it's, it's very beautiful, the story, because uh, as uh, Jay Bai mentioned, there's a symbol of idea of equality. Actually, if you see many of the Shiva stories, Shiva and Parvati, you'll see that both of them argue, is, is both of them have, they win the argument sometimes, it's a proper kind of marriage of equals. But I think in a way it symbolizes uh, in a way how a marriage should be. So in a way, all, all of us, as well as ones who are married, is a very nice example to learn from how to live in terms of, uh, in terms of a kind of a married life. So it's very, very popular. It's a very, very big event. And by the way, one of the other reasons why people uh, celebrate Mahashivali is seen in also the marriage of Shiva and Parvati. But the story is very long. It goes into his father, Daksha, who kind of humiliated her and, and, and all that stuff. We won't go through it now. But it's a very, very uh, endearing and a powerful story. Fantastic. Sita, one more question for you, which is, uh, what's the significance of Lord Shiva's sacred mantra, Om Namo Shivai? Uh, yes, uh, that's a very sacred uh, mantra. I mean, we're basically saying um, we're paying reverence, we're paying tribute um, to the idea of Shiva. Um, but the one that really sort of 
you know strikes a chord with me is shivoham shivoham which means i am shiva and as dad said in the video um you know if you say that in the vishnu tradition that they would say oh no how could you say you how can you equate yourself <laughs> to vishnu how can you dare you say that but in the shiva tradition it's actually encouraged which i think is a beautiful thing so that's the wonderful thing with hinduism is we have such a variety of different approaches if you think no no i can't equate myself to god then maybe the vishnu tradition is right for you but with the shiva tradition if you want to sort of empower yourself i think it's a beautiful way of merging this idea of god with form and god without form faith and other way are merged in the shiva tradition amazing fabulous so uh, the video back uh, sorry uh, yeah video back the the symbolism uh, sorry the relevance of lord shiva in modern hinduism how does his mythology and teachings relate to modern times and issues that we face in the modern world Oh, in, in many different ways. I think <clears throat> the key thing about Shiva is that if you look at his attributes you have, like, you know, the idea of, as Jay Bhai mentioned, Ashutosh, easy to please. But he's got, Shiva has got many, many names. And every name you look at, in a way, is endearing because the idea of, you know, Bolenath, you know, basically a, a simple, a lot of the simple, you know, simple people. So in many ways, the attributes of Shiva, the, the key attribute I would like is the idea of renunciation. Quite often in this modern world, we spend so much time accumulating things. And half the times we don't need those things, right? We don't need them. If you look at it very carefully and it's accumulate. But Shiva is totally opposite. There's nothing, they can, I mean, if you look at him, he sits in Kailas in open space, has got a tiger skin or, you know, whatever, or beer skin as, as a kind of a skirt, that's it. Ash on the body, not even proper clothes on the top. And even his, uh, some of the necklaces are you know, Rudraksh beads, natural, you know, natural beads. So in a way, if you look at his symbolism, it's actually renunciation. So in a way, that's one thing we can take uh, from uh, Shiva's uh, life in that sense. Other thing also to think about Shiva is, Ed, as mentioned earlier, now Manish by Sita Ben, Shiva can be worshipped in a number of ways. He's so easy to please. I mean, you can do elaborate ritual if you want to, he doesn't mind. Or you can just put a simple bilva leaf, he'll treat you equally. So idea of equality comes in Shiva. Don't judge somebody because they give you more or less. Just judge them for, for, their, for their what you call, for the true love, basically, in a way. So it doesn't matter in Shiva. All the stories of Shiva you see, some people even sacrifice themselves to Shiva. Some just put a bilva leaf. Some will put lots of milk on him. Some will do a lot of irrebel puja. He goes, everything is fine. But Shiva is very easy to please. There's no specific rule. So in a way, it's, it's, one thing you can learn from that is, Treat no matter what you, what person you know, any person you know, no matter what the station in life is, situation, treat them with dignity and respect and equally. That's one thing which comes out of Shiva as well. There's a lot of other kind of facets. The other one I like is also the idea of Arth Narishwar because, you know, half woman and half man. In a way, the idea of equality really comes through because they're both seen as both are facets of an individual. Because we all have, right? We all have feminine aspects and we all have masculine, whether we're male or female. In a way, it combines the two, and that's, of course, very unique only to Shiva. So idea of equality comes in as well. So there's so many things we can learn from Shiva. It's, it's really amazing um, uh, to look at here. Yeah? Fabulous. What an amazing, uh, you know, bit of information I've learned as well, some new things from you all. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, Sita Ben, next question for you is, the portrayal of Lord Shiva in popular culture, is it appropriate or do you think it represents his true nature and significance uh, yeah i mean i think uh, i think he's, he's presented in, in a wonderful way it shows the simplicity and the beauty of of the spiritual path and it's very empowering and it's also it shows you know because another name for shiva that he's got so many names is gananat which means lord of all groups basically so whatever you know your background is are you rich are you poor are you clever? Are you not clever? Are you, are you this or that? It doesn't matter in the eyes of Shiva. You are all, you know, equal in the eyes of Shiva. And I think that's a really relevant thing for the world today, because in a world where, you know, we're starting to become so much more aware about different races and different, uh, you know, gender preferences and all sorts of things like that. It's actually gives some kind of spiritual foundation to it, saying that underneath all of these apparent differences, it's the same divinity, it's the same spirit. So actually, it's not just a case of being politically correct. There is a truth to it, that there is everyone is spiritually divine underneath the appearance of all these different skin colors or different preferences for different things. Fabulous, fabulous. Manish Pai, here's one for you. 
uh, given your colorful background that you've got, uh, what is the impact of Lord Shiva on uh, Indian art, literature, philosophy? How has his mythology and teachings influenced Indian culture and society over the centuries? Uh, yes, the Shiva tradition has had a great impact on the Indian culture and tradition. Um, the whole culture of South India, I would say, is based on, you know, the Siva tradition and uh, Siva plays a great part. All this, um, the idea of Bharatanatyam and uh, Siva is considered, uh, you know, the lord of the dance as well, as in Atraj. So the idea of using dance to please the, uh, and reach uh, the ultimate reality comes through that as well. And so is the yoga tradition. So all these wonderful things uh, coming from Siva tradition, and it's always been there. Um, so it, it's a wonderful thing. Fabulous. So Vijay, my next question for you, we've touched upon Shaivism a little bit, but what is the importance of Lord Shiva in the Shiva, Shiva tradition of Hinduism and how does it differ from other Hindu traditions? What role does Lord Shiva play in it, uh, et cetera? Could you share some light on that? Okay, so I think the Kashmir tradition, there's vast, vast uh, different kind of tradition in, in, in India. But I would say that, for example, if you look at the Kashmiri Shaivism, in a way, it's very non-dualistic. As Sita mentioned, the idea of I am Shiva, I am Shiva is very popular there. And you'd be surprised that in Kashmiri Shaivism, Shaivism some of the great uh, scholars of Shiva have written literally thousands and thousands of pages, thousands of pages uh, describing the, you know, the grace of Shiva or you know, an order to Shiva. They've, so there's a vast tradition and it's quite a few different variations. If you look at South India, if you look at the village life, then of course Shiva is worshipped as a lingam and you just uh, put the leaves. And if you go to big temples, they have more rituals. So again, the idea of Shiva, there's different traditions of Shiva and they all see Shiva in different angles. And that's all okay too, because Shiva is very, very broad and it's quite diverse as well. If you go to some of the, I actually had a chance to do puja in um, Somna temple once, and a priest came. I did a lot of rituals with that. Yet, if I go to my village, village temple is very simple. You just put, give some milk, milk, a coconut, and that's it. So, different ways of, of worshiping Shiva. But the different vast traditions in Shiva, because Shiva has always been a, a very popular and, and all India kind of deity. So, very unique in that sense. Yeah. Fabulous. Sita Ben, here's a question for you. So, when we were younger and we used to go to Mahashivratri, when I'm saying younger, I'm not saying too young, but in our early 20s and so on. Uh, one of the things that used to be very interesting for us was this thandai, the cold drink that is offered there. And uh, there is a little bit of controversy over the use of cannabis as an offering to Lord Shiva. Is it an appropriate or valid part of Shiva worship or does it contradict his teachings and values? Uh, so, yes, I mean, we obviously have to be very careful about all these um, <laughs> drinks and drugs and all of that kind of thing. I mean, we have to be very careful because the idea of, you know, trying to sort of escape from the idea of the body, you can do it through a physical way by having too much to drink or having drugs and, and that kind of thing. But we have to be very careful because the Shiva tradition is not there to promote this kind of behavior. <laughs> uh, what we have to say is that Sometimes people use it as a bit of a, you know, a, st a stimulant to help them maybe feel like they're kind of having an out-of-body experience. Um, but we have to also keep everything in check, keep everything in moderation. So it's something that's got associated with the with the Shiva tradition. Um, it's not something that's being promoted by the Shiva tradition by any means. But somehow or other, these sort of intoxicants help us. want to experience have a spiritual experience and you try to get that to get that sort of sensation but we have to remember that taking drugs and intoxicants is is not promoted um you know in, in the way that you know you become addicted to it or whatever because by having a physical stimulant you are sort of you know putting the cart before the horse you're not doing the spiritual hard work and the discipline that you need in order to have that out-of-body experience without the need of drugs and all of that so it's not promoted but it's somehow linked to the shiva tradition in a sort of celebratory way but in very in control and in moderation i think <laughs> well, 
fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> Vijay Bhai, the interpretation of Lord Shiva's personality, is he a peaceful and compassionate deity <clears throat> or as his mythology depicts him at times of a fierce and a wrathful figure? So Shiva comes again in multiple facets, even the names like Mahakal, you know, the controller of all time. We have all different facets of Shiva. I mean, that reflects the true deity, right? You know, I think we have to keep one thing in mind is that unlike in the Abrahamic faiths where you have this idea of a devil or something sitting in the hell and causing all this stuff, God has to be everything. So not only, not only in Shiva tradition, in any deity of Hinduism, God is all encompassing. We ultimately, the idea of destruction and creation is part of Shiva too. So everything is part of Shiva. So grace, yeah. happiness, destruction. compassion, you know, everything. And the idea of the destruction as well is part of Shiva. Shiva is all encompassing. It has to be that way. That's the only way you can see the supreme, you know, uh, Brahman in, in form of Shiva. That's the best way of looking at it. Yeah. Fabulous. Uh, Manish Pai, there was some controversy some time back. I read online about some people uh, not very happy over the portrayal of Lord Shiva in media and art. Is it acceptable to depict him in a manner that's offensive and disrespectful to his mythology and values? Uh, definitely not. Uh, you know, people have uh, uh, revered Shiva and uh, he is the most ancient and uh, very widely uh, worshipped deity. And uh, as, uh, you know, any religions, uh, uh, they should be, you know, respectful for the way uh, uh, they are uh, portraying the idea behind the particular deities. As as uh, no one, uh, you know, as you wouldn't do uh, things they are with some of the popular religions. So should uh, uh, Saivism and Hinduism should be respected for their, uh, you know, uh, images and uh, ideas we have. Fabulous. Uh, sit a bit. The impact of Lord Shiva on other cultures and religions. How has his mythology influenced the beliefs and practices of other traditions, for example, like Buddhism or Jainism? Uh, yes, I mean, I because uh, the idea of the Shiva tradition is not so personality based in the way that other um, sort of traditions are. And both Jainism and Buddhism focus on the idea of not thinking of God as a personality. They like to think of, forget the idea about God altogether and think of ourselves as, as being spiritual beings, essentially. So I think it's wonderful that actually we've got that all encompassing, um, you know, as different aspects within Hinduism and Buddhism and Jain Jainism are are very different in the sense that you know we always think about Hinduism as being the, the one to do with all the personalities and all the gods and goddesses and all of that um, but the Shiva tradition is probably the closest in the sense to to Buddhism and Jainism because it doesn't focus on personality it focuses on principles and trying to resolve our human condition here and now because both Buddhism and Jainism are very practical in that sense. You know, they try and find ways of dealing with suffering. They try and find ways of dealing with how to live in the world without, you know, shedding so much, you know, creating so much violence or trying to hurt other living things. So I think it's very practical. And I think the Shiva tradition is also very, very practical. It says, let's cut to the chase, forget all the elaborate rituals and all the ceremonials. Let's focus on resolving our human condition here and now. Yeah, sorry. Wonderful. So I think, folks, we're going to summarize this topic and, and put it to an end so we can carry on with a few of the other questions that the viewers have put in. So in summary, Lord Shiva is a central figure in Hindu mythology and spirituality, revered as the Lord of the universe, the destroyer of evil and the embodiment of compassion and transformation. His mythology and teachings have influenced Indian culture and society for centuries continue to have a significant source, uh, continue to be a significant source of inspiration, wisdom, and spiritual guidance for millions of people around the world. The symbolism and significance of the Tandav dance, which is a sacred dance form associated with Lord Shiva, will remain an important aspect of Hindu art and culture. And it continues to be celebrated and honored in various forms of dance and music. While debates and discussions surrounding Lord Shiva and his mythology are ongoing, they offer a valuable opportunity to explore the complexity, diversity, and the richness of Hinduism. 
and to deepen our understanding of its beliefs, practices, and values. Ultimately, Lord Shiva's teachings and values are relevant to the modern world, offering insights into issues such as compassion, self-realization, the cyclical nature of life and death. As we continue to explore and celebrate his greatness, we can find a source of inspiration and solace in his divine presence and a deeper connection to the beauty and the wonder of the universe. So I'm going to now hand over to Manish Pai to carry on with the rest of the viewer questions while I jump onto the live streams and try and uh, catch some more questions. Manish Pai, over to you. Thank you, Nisid Bhai, a wonderful topic, and we can continue. Uh, next question is from NKS. Um, so as we see in Hinduism, the two major movements are Saivism and then there is a Vaishnavism. And the two are very different looking tradition. So NKS is asking how is uh, Vaishnavism and Saivism created and for what and why? Vijay Bhai? Okay, uh, tricky question, Deepu, tricky question, because I think don't think we really know for sure. I think from what I understand is that Shaivism has got very early precursor kind of deities which are linked to, Sh to Shiva, which is in Indus Valley. In that sense, it's very old. For Vaishnavism, I don't think there's any clear kind of um, idea of when it actually started. But one thing to keep in mind is that in the ancient traditions that we know of, which basically in the Vedic tradition, they actually we did not have that much focus on Vishnu or Shiva. It was mainly the idea of Brahman and Atman and the idea of de you know, deifying uh, natural forces. So they, in a way, came, they became more prominent and popular after that. Nevertheless, as Shiva has been popular from what we see for quite a while, worship, but in a maybe different form, not the one we see today. So there's no clear idea of when. But you know, Hinduism is very broad and it's very pluralistic tradition. So quite often we have different traditions which uh, kind of grow in different, different communities or different parts of India. And some, sometimes even join up, three murtis joined up. Somebody's put all the three to go, you know, Brahma, Vishnu, mm -hmm. Shiva together. And seen as three murti, right? And they've seen all three as facets of Brahman. One, one Brahman having three facets, the idea of generator, operator, and destroyer. So God, as they call it, G-O-D. So in a way, uh, there's no clear-cut uh, data as such. Yeah? So I can add to that, Asita. Uh, yeah, I think the, the thing with uh, when we think about the idea of ultimate reality is that we often create God in our own image. We create God the way we want that God to appear. So, you know, we give multiple arms, we give them this appearance and that appearance. And that's why we've got so such a variety of different ways of thinking of God as a personality within Hinduism. And um, it, it allows for it. It's a beautiful approach because it reflects the difference of, you know, how many different people there are, how many different temperaments there are in the world. So actually, it's beautiful because you can pick and choose the approach that suits you the best. And I mean, as, as Vijay Bhai said, I don't know the exact origin of how these images came about exactly. But I think it's a beautiful celebration of the diversity of humanity, the different temperaments, the different kinds of people there are out there. Some people love colorful rituals. Some people don't love colorful rituals. Some people love meditation. Some people do. So it's one of those things you can pick and choose the path that suits you the best. Hmm. That is wonderful to hear. Um, so in the past, uh, Sita Ben, there had been some uh, clashes between say, say whites and uh, Vaishnavites, and there were debates and some pundits, you know, trying to prove that one is greater than the other and so on. How did uh, some, uh, you know, nowadays we don't see any of that. Uh, people accept uh, they are for what they are and uh, have moved on. What, what's, what's happened here, uh, Sitavin? I mean, it's a shame if there are clashes because that, that means they haven't really understood what Hinduism is all about. It's just ingrained within Hindu philosophy to have a variety of different approaches. And the Vishnu tradition and the Shiva tradition are very different in their approaches. But the beautiful thing is, as you sort of make progress on your particular journey, whether it's the Vaishnava tradition, the Shiva tradition, or any other tradition within Hinduism or not even within Hinduism, you start finding an affinity with the, everybody around you. It doesn't matter what their religious slant is, what their spiritual take is. You naturally start to feel an affinity for those around you. And you find a tremendous unity different points on the circumference of a circle we all have different starting points and we have to acknowledge that and recognize that everyone has got a different slant 
everyone has got a you know very unique spiritual journey you know over so many lifetimes we believe in reincarnation obviously so we've all gone through all sorts of different meandering pathways and we are all going towards the same trajectory we are all in, going in the same direction and I think it's a, a thing to celebrate rather than something that should be a cause for conflict um, so I think it shows real understanding that if you actually look at it within Hinduism you see very little clashes compared to what you see in other parts of the world in terms of religious points of view so I think we're, we're lucky in the sense that we have this within our system and it's something that we can hopefully share with other traditions and other parts of the world to say look hang on guys we're all going in the same direction anyway what does it matter if you're coming from this point or I'm coming from this point what does it matter we're all going the same way at the end of the day uh, Vijay <coughs> Yes, yeah, yeah, sorry. I think Manishpa, I think I think I, nowadays as Sita mentioned, there's not much clash. I think Hinduism has moved. But I remember reading once the history of Tamil uh, Tamil people, and there was a question about something about Nayanars, which are the all the Shiva and Alvars. And quite often they had a lot of heated debates. This is now talking about I think 1,500, 600 years ago. And it was quite heated debates sometimes because they had really revered their own saints. And so I said, no, no, you, you can't, your saints can't be right, my saints. But there were some heated arguments and maybe some clashes, but in a way, it's still very, that's the only example I know to be honest, from all of India. Generally, it's fine. So to be very rare, of course, there are some movements which are very, um, saying that my God is supreme and yours is perhaps not supreme. But again, it's his own point of view, right? Everybody says that my deity is supreme for me. So that, that will happen. But at least there is no saying that only mine is right. You, you know, I don't want you anymore. Let me get rid of you. That kind of doesn't happen. But generally, it's been quite uh, a good kind of you know synergy in that sense. Yeah, that's uh, wonderful to hear. Uh, I think Jamin Mysuria, your questions are, are answered. I think there. So although yes, some uh, traditions will consider the deity to be supreme, but as long as they are not uh, causing issues with other uh, broader Hinduism, they can carry on the way they want to carry on. That's no problem. We uh, take the next question from Oshik Roy. He's saying, could you please give some brief idea about Vedic era? Vijay Bhai. Okay, Vedic era was very unique and very different. But all I would suggest is if you look at the Vedic era, I mean, it was a lot of it was to do with the idea of, you know, Agni worship, the idea of, you know, Varun Dev, all the ancient deities which you know, which are the nature force personified. And at one point, they started looking inwards. And that's where you have the Upanishads. So the Upanishads of Brahman, Atman, they are very, very popular. Also, one thing you notice in the ancient times, quite interesting in Vedic era, you notice that there were no big temples. If you look at there were no history. When I say ancient times, I mean really ancient. Because in the Hinduism is so old, not a thousand years or one thousand five years. That's that time we had temples. Very ancient time before you know three thousand years or whatever. You don't find temples. You find a lot of schools or gurukuls. Where they have a huge havan area in the middle, a courtyard, you know, built with Vastu tradition. And they do all these idea of worship, you know, worship the Brahman or Atman inside through the idea of havans. And today you see the Arya tradition, Arya Sama tradition kind of carry on from that idea. So in that sense, it's very different. But one thing I would say which is really endearing about the Vedic era is the idea of debates. You see so many debates between different Acharyas, even the idea of a lot of Rishikas as well, you know, like Gargi, Bharti. Maitreyi, Vak, they debate as well, and debate on the idea of nature of reality. And you see, that's something very endearing. So as far as that old times in India, people are debating the nature of reality, nature of God. There was nobody coming with a sword saying, if you don't believe, you know, you're out. They were actually debating in a healthy manner. So, I mean, one of the key things you find from the debate was Hinduism eventually got to the idea of that the soul is created. Soul is not created in Hinduism, right? Soul is actually eternal. And why? Because if you create something, then you have dash card limit as we can say traps you. So you can't create something. It, can't, it has to be, if it's eternal, it can't be created. So a lot of these ideas eventually evolved to what we have today. So debates were very, very powerful, very healthy, but there was a kind of error. So in many ways, the deities, as you see today, Vishnu, Shiva, and they all came a bit later. So idea of Shakti as an energy or a form of, you know, a form of energy of Brahman, yes. But deities became much more after that. So but after that, I still mean 2,000 years old, right? <laughs> it doesn't. That's the Vedic era in short. So, I mean, one thing I would say is the one thing I did like, if you look at Vedic era, 
if you get a chance to watch the old chanakya series i think chandra by chandra prakash duivedi you'll get a glimpse of what vedic era was like how the guru kuls done and how they should debate and so you get some idea and you notice that there's no temples there's no the way we worship today but still nevertheless it's it's very interesting kind of way of looking at the idea of that vedic era sita Oh, yeah, I think you've covered it amazingly. I mean, yeah, that's exactly what it was. It was like looking at the forces of nature around us and sort of personifying them. And so that's kind of how it started. And actually, it reminds me a little bit of the story of Krishna, because as as Vijay Bhai said, all these gods and, you know, like the gods that we know in Hinduism, they came later. And the story of Krishna, where he, he lifts up the mountain, Um, because they're kind of like what it's representing is this sort of change in attitude away from this idea of deifying the forces of nature because Krishna is showing that you know the the rain Indra was becoming very arrogant and he was showering too much rain on everybody and causing floods and Krishna had to come along and save the day and lift the mountain and give shelter to everybody um so it's showing a shift in attitude in the way that we like to think of god away from this idea of forces of nature because as humanity evolves and we start getting a better understanding of the world around us we are not so in fear we are not so you know shaking or quivering in the face of the forces of nature we're able to harness them and make use of them so it's showing the evolution of human these deities coming in later like krishna and vishnu and shiva and they come afterwards so it's a very interesting journey because it shows the evolution of human thinking and how we kind of develop and it's a reflection of Yeah. That's wonderful to hear. We take the next question from Daniel Hirani. He's saying um more well, many people say I am Brahman or I'm from per Brahman and uh, he's asking why per Brahman only talk to individual person so the per uh, person will have individual experience. and why not to the society or group so that uh, everyone can agree that this entity exists and everyone is on the same page why is is like that isn't it a human psychology he says sita ben uh yeah i mean that's the thing sometimes you look at the words of um of spiritually enlightened people and you think why are they only saying it to a very small number of people and you have to understand that actually they are only addressing that small congregation because that suits their sort of requirement their sort of temperament and if you sort of take the words of spiritual masters out of context it makes you think oh what are they saying that doesn't make any sense um so you have to sort of uh, the spiritual message has to be fed in a way that will get digested by the people who are listening to it um and that's why you know for a certain group of people a slightly different message may be necessary and for another group of people a slightly different message <clears throat> may be necessary but then that's where the issues of conflict start to happen because you start comparing the different prescriptions given and you say hey hang on they sound completely contradictory to each other i mean for example it's it's not in hinduism but for example jesus he talks about his father in heaven disciples he says i and my father are one so there could be two very different messages and it makes you think what is jesus saying but it's because he's trying to address the congregation that he is speaking to because every spiritual message the spirituality itself is so incredibly vast but it has to come through the context of <coughs> a person's mindset their words their vocabulary the people that they're talking to suit the needs of the people that he is talking to um so it's a very interesting way to sort of look at spirituality because we all have very different temperaments we all digest it things in very different ways so it's not a universal in that sense but it is all going towards the same goal uh vijay bhai yeah it's a very interesting question actually manish bhai i mean and i can see why is asked because if i if i experience something as an individual Uh, to what what to add to what Sita said, if I say individual, then there's no peer review, right? There's nobody else going to review if that actually makes me is correct. If you're in a group and if both group group people get this experience, oh yeah, yeah, it matches. We all together, so it must be true. 
I think that's what the question is trying to say here. But it's a valid point. I mean, I've been challenging this point also with uh, when I go to interfaith by the monotheist faith. They go, look, when we do congregation, we see experience together, whatever. But I think one thing you have to keep in mind, Hinduism sees it different. We see that every individual is on a, on a spiritual journey. We don't have the idea that, you know, communists, everybody will experience in their own unique way because we are all different. That's why you will not have the idea of groups together saying, you know, feel the power of Brahman because they are different. They're very different. Myself and my friends, babe, we think very differently. Some are more speaking than others. So why should everybody get, you know, the idea of Brahman experience together? It doesn't make sense. It makes sense. When you, but anyway, once you get the experience, then you can actually pass that knowledge to others, as Sita mentioned. Then they can use the knowledge to, you know, to go on the same journey. So it's an interesting question, I guess. Yeah, that's all I can add to that, uh, Manish. Bye. Yes, that is a very interesting question. And I think the, also the spiritual experience is always individual. It's not like it happens to a whole group of people's same experience. So how can then, because different people are at different level and yes. that's why I think it doesn't happen to all at once to everyone. Yeah. And that's, that's where the problem comes, I suppose. Uh, last question from Charmaine is for you, Sita Ben. Does Uma know the story of Lubdaka? Lubdaka? I, to be honest, yeah, I, I, to be honest, I don't know that story myself. If I did, then yeah. I would definitely tell Uma. Okay. I don't know. So, yeah, it's, it's a I nice story, story. Yeah, that one. <laughs> it was a fire. I think that it's, it's about firewood, <laughs> right? Uh, Manish Bhai, the fire woodcutter, I believe. And who went at night and threw thousands of leaves on Shiva's. I can't remember the story. And he was protected okay, at night. Yes. It's a nice, interesting I, story. I don't know the name, but it could be that one. Uh, yeah, I think that's the one with the five woodcutter. Very nice story, actually. <laughs> Love, lovely for kids. <laughs> See, that went something to look up. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, yes, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another bedtime story, definitely. <laughs> Over to you. So, folks, we've had a most wonderful session today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us and being part of the beautiful celebration of Lord Shiva and Mahashivratri. We are grateful for your presence, your energy, and your devotion. And we hope that you found this live stream to be a source of inspiration and spiritual upliftment. Now, we know that you have taken time out of your busy schedules to be with us, and we want to appreciate your commitment to your spiritual practice and your love for Lord Shiva. We also want to thank you for being part of the Hindu Academy community and for joining us every Saturday at 2 o'clock to celebrate the greatness of Hinduism in the modern world. Before we wrap up, we want to remind you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we post new videos every week, uh, well, throughout the week. Uh, and so you can see new stuff before uh, the rest. Uh, we want to invite you to come back and join us next Saturday at 2 o'clock for another exciting and inspiring episode of our live stream series. Once again, happy Mahashivratri to all those who are celebrating the day. May Lord Shiva bless you with his divine grace and guidance and may his teachings and values inspire you to live a life of joy, peace and purpose. Thank you for being with us today. And we look forward to seeing you next Saturday. And thank you to the wonderful team here, including our special special guest light speaker today, Uma. Bye, everybody, and see you next week on Saturday, 2 o'clock.